good morning and good afternoon to in-house counsel from all across North America and the world, probably. Welcome to In-House Connect. My name is Shai Mahani. I'm the CEO and co-founder of In-House Connect, and I'm thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you for spending your lunch or your breakfast time with us. And of course, special thanks to our presenter and our sponsor today, Dave Stevens, the fantastic Dave Stevens of the Stevens Law Group. And for those of you who are here for the first time, let me give you a quick bit of background on In-House Connect. In-House Connect started 11 years ago as a New York City-based meetup group for in-house counsel. Every month, In-House Connect would organize free CLE classes, which were followed by cocktail networking receptions. And every six months or so, we would organize fun and festive networking mixers. Over the years, we've helped thousands of in-house counsel connect with peers and outside counsel alike. Everything was going great. And then COVID hit. So we couldn't meet in person. So we met online, but it's been a fantastic transition. I'm sure all would agree. I certainly agree. You know, now we can attract a much larger audience of in-house counsel, truly from coast to coast. And we've been able to facilitate way more networking and relationship building. And we've been able to feature excellent, excellent speakers like the one we have today, who I'm going to introduce in just a few moments. Um, this is actually our 13th event of the year. And I'm curious, is this your first IHC event? Have you attended one in the past? Let me know in this poll. Let's get going with today's event. Key strategies for protecting IP in contract negotiations. Our presenter today is Dave Stevens. Dave Stevens' IP practice includes patent prosecution, transactions, due diligence work, agreements, opinions, including validity, infringement, patentability, right to practice, and freedom to operate opinions, counseling, offensive and defensive patent issues, licensing, and litigation. He also serves as an expert witness in technical and intellectual property legal issues and has been called as a fact witness in enforcement actions involving the many patents he has written. He's also an expert in copyright, including software, publications, products and artworks, and other copyrightable forms and open source issues. He works with foreign IP firms and foreign clients with respect to domestic and international patent prosecution, including patent cooperation treaty work. We are so, I mean, Dave is dynamo in IP. There's literally nothing, you know, if I had an IP question, I'm sure Dave knows the answer to it. So we are very excited and, and glad to have him here to help us understand how to mitigate IP risk in contract negotiations. So with that, I will turn things over to Dave. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thanks everybody for being here. It's, it's great watching these numbers climb. I, yeah, so we're going to talk about protection, um, protecting your IP in contract negotiations. And a little deeper in, we're going to go into specific sections of contracts, for examples, but put in any questions you have in chat. I'm happy to talk about any particular sections. We can do the questions and answers too, but um, I'd be happy to take this sideways and look into another section that you guys are interested in um, and we'll you know, get a feel for it as we go along. Um, primarily what we're talking about, anybody who's seen it in my other talks, they've seen this graphic before. It's, it's the closed innovation, open innovation uh, illustration that you often see in the Chesborough world. Um, and basically, if you look at the closed innovation, this is the old school type companies where innovation is kept clamped inside of a company. Well, that's just not the realist, that's not reality anymore for, you know, certainly startups and really any company um, that is dealing with technology. And I like putting this illustration up because <clears throat> it shows you kind of a, from, from a visual standpoint that IP, intellectual property, trade secrets and uh, patents, copyrights, all these things, they end up getting transferred in and out of your company in many, many ways, whether it's certainly you know, public with your advertising, um, transactions, uh, joint development uh, activity in your business. And you really need to understand the, the functions and operations of your company and where IP is flowing around to understand how to protect it. And how it's flowing around and how you allow it to flow around is really based on your contracts. It's based on, you know, starting with NDAs, uh, any kind of confidentiality agreement, any interaction that you have on the outside, you're going to be governing what is happening with your IP how you are allowing others to use your IP and how you are protecting it internally and externally. Now, the goal here, uh, and I'm imposing this goal here, is it's, it's what I want every in-house counsel to achieve. 
and that's to be an expert IP strategist. And I, I know lots of you reach out to your experts and, pe and people like me, you're looking for advice, you really wanna just hand it off and say, look, you're the expert here, tell me what to do. And I'm here to build up a little bit on your side to make you an IP expert. You don't need to be a registered patent attorney or a trademark specialist or a trade secret expert to understand what you need to understand to protect your company. You want your outside experts. You want your, your round table as it is, right? You want your experts to call on it. But day to day, sometimes you need to act. You need to move. And more importantly, you need to manage outside counsel and experts that you're using so that you understand what they're providing you and what that value is. And you spending a little more time just studying a bit on what intellectual property is and how a company uses it, how your company can use it as a strategic asset, it can really help you in that regard. And even more importantly, I think it helps you become the internal strategic expert, not just the person who's managing the contracts, not just the person who is advising on how to file patents and trademarks and budgets and all these different things. <clears throat> You really belong at the strategy table when lead negotiators, CEOs, COOs, CIOs, when, when you're really developing your business plan, you belong there. You belong there because you can help all the stakeholders in your company figure out how to use intellectual property, how to build it, how to acquire it, how to own it, how to license it, and how to receive inboard, outboard licenses of you know, intellectual property so that you can use it as a strategic asset and really add value to the company. Uh, and again, your, your destination is a seat at the strategy table, an essential advisor, and you can become that. I've had clients come to me, general counsels, and they'll say, you know, at the firm where I used to work, I can tell you where the patent lawyers sit. I can tell you where the copyright attorneys and the trademark attorneys sit. That's about as much as I know. And you know what? You can learn a little bit more. You don't need to know exactly how they, they file and protect these things, but you can understand enough about what these intellectual property assets are so that you can figure out how to use them as strategic assets. You don't need, you need to be an attorney to understand that. In fact, I have friends at Hewlett Packard who are probably the most sophisticated intellectual property programs on, on the planet. And many of them are not even attorneys. They're just really smart strategists who figured out how to use intellectual property and leverage it. And you could do the same thing. <clears throat> so let's talk about a contract. You're entering into a particular contract. And you want to do this before you enter into contracts. And in general, you want to set up the infrastructure, the ecosystem. <laughs> let's talk about if you just don't have that right now or you don't have a view on it, you're thrown into this negotiation. Let's say you're going to do a joint development agreement with another company. And suddenly a lot of stuff is at stake, intellectual property, all different contracts, and not just what you currently own. Intellectual property is created in these relationships, is created every day in your company. When inventors, engineers, marketing people, they're creating things, creating content, making technical inventions, all of those things. And keep in mind that every single thing, every single intellectual property asset, patents, copyrights, and, uh, and, and trademarks, they start as a trade secret. They start as a trade secret in somebody's mind before they share it. And hopefully they're only sharing it internally initially, but sometimes you could spontaneously share it externally, like when engineers get together or when a maybe a CEO or other leader is at a conference and there's a question and answer, how would you do this? Oh, well, in our, we have technology and we could do this and this is how we would build it. There goes your trade secret, right? You can protect this stuff before you share it. And you really wanna understand what those things are so that you can at least put these, this infrastructure in place, not to put barriers up for the business negotiators and people who are driving the business, but to have this infrastructure so that whatever they create, technical, marketing, content, even artistic stuff, you can protect that stuff before it gets out while it is still a trade secret to your company, right? So pre-contract, 
you want to do an assessment of what you have. You could even do a formal audit. We do audits all the time. We go into a company and an audit is, I know it sounds scary like a financial audit, but it's a very positive thing. You do a triage on every single thing you have in the company. You talk to the technical people, the engineers, the product people, the marketing people. All these people have different views on what the company has, what they're doing, what the roadmap is, what they're expecting to create, what they've already created, even in the last years. You can still protect those things, um, whether you're filing patents, filing copyrights, or if you're just securing them as a trade secret. And you have to deliberately do that. So in the pre-contract phase, you're doing the triage, you're looking at what you've got. During the activity under the contract, that's when things are really in play, especially when you're creating new things. Because imagine you're in the joint development agreement, right? You've got NDAs, you've got joint development agreements, multiple agreements at stake. You even have vendor agreements if they're making something for you. You have all these different types of agreements and you wanna make sure that you understand and that you've postured the company so that you can protect the intellectual property that is yours. And in things like joint development agreements, <clears throat> I mentioned that because many things, even though they're not even called joint development agreements formally, you're jointly developing things with people on the outside, right? Um, here's a good example. There's a company, a very large European company that was looking to solve a problem. And the problem was, we want to read 40 million smart meters simultaneously every 15 minutes, bubble up the data and mine the data, right? And this big company didn't have that expertise, they didn't think so. And what they did is they sent out kind of this open uh, uh, problem statement and they wanted a product to be built to, to accommodate that, right? So they did, a software company built it. Now, this company that built it, they ended up with all the intellectual property. They just took this high level um, problem statement, they built this product, filed patents, did all these things, and they owned it. Now, the company that is that hired this vendor could have done it differently from the beginning. What they could have done is said, okay, let's get a bunch of smart people together, some consultants, the smartest people we have in the company. Let's break down this problem statement. And that problem statement, as you break it down, is the most important thing. Because you take these, this, this very detailed problem statement, which are details of things we need, requirements for the product. Some of them are technical questions or problems that need to be solved. Technical things need to be built to address this problem statement and to deliver the service and product. And you can start solving those problems. You put those in front of engineers, engineers can solve them all day. You just don't always want to give the engineers the question of what problem do you want to solve? So when you do that in the joint development uh, uh, arena, or if you're just sending something out to a vendor to build something, the more you can solve these problems, the more intellectual property that you have, you can do that pre-contract. Now, what happened with this European company, they ended up losing everything to this vendor, which they thought was fine. The vendor is one deserving the service in the delivering the service and the product. But they discovered two things. One is they felt they couldn't choose another vendor if they weren't happy. Second, they actually took this product and sold it to their competitor. And they could do that with impunity because they own the intellectual property. And the big company did not have the foresight to look at this and see, you know, maybe we should capture this and control this really awesome thing that is a big business differentiator and own some of it so that we can have not just freedom to operate, but some ability to exclude others from using our technology. So you think about it from the large company's point of view or, or just the, any company looking for an outside service or asking to have something built, there's an auto, awful lot of intellectual property that you can get on the books for your company before you even talk to the vendors. Patents are rough, you know, they don't have to actually build the thing to get protection. So you can file all types of intellectual property protection on the technology that you're going to have built before it's even built. And this is pre-contract. This is pre-contract. You're, you're looking to build something. You're laying out your requirements as a customer in that example. And 
You want things built and problem solved. To the extent that you could do some of that yourself, you can get the pre-contract on actual property. When you enter into the contract, you already own it. You could give them a license to use it to provide you services, but they can't take it and use it for your competitors or anyone else. You can still let them do that with a license, but that's, that's a business question. So pre-contract, you want to do the triage and possibly build up intellectual property that will be valuable to you, that is achievable to you before you engage with an outside uh, entity. <clears throat> because during the contract, you're going to start having different rules where, hey, what we created, we keep. What you create, you keep. And what we jointly create, we'll get into that. That's an issue. After the activity under contract is concluded, you still have intellectual property, right? There are, there's ongoing intellectual property patents last 20 years from when you file it. Um, copyrights last a long time and trade secrets can last indefinitely as long as you keep them secret. So there's all this activity that goes on during the contract when the product is being used and business goes forward, both for you and this other company that you're engaged with in a contract, there are questions over who can use what after this engagement. And you want to ask those questions, preferably pre-contract. So when you're negotiating the contract, you can know when the stuff is created, who owns it. And you need to do that because, for example, what if somebody solves a technical problem? You have this intellectual property, you file a patent, you have some trade secrets around it. Who owns that? Well, it might seem easy until you start you start merging these, these employees of different companies together and they have different ideas of who owns what. And you want to make it very clear under the contract. And this is the most common hotspot when you're talking about intellectual property and how to protect it, what you own before you get into a contract. And it's something you really got to be ready for. And the more you are prepared pre-contract before you negotiate the contract, the better off you are. During the contract, lots of decisions are made. Some decisions are already made based on what gets produced, who owns it. No, we have it in the contract, it's already done. We own it, you get a license, or you own it, we get a license. So you wanna think about these things and be prepared when you're negotiating the contract. Again, you don't have to be an expert in patents, trademarks, trade secrets, but when you're looking at the contract, you need to figure out how to spot the issues and see these things of who owns what. And if you can do that pre-contract and even during the contract, you're gonna be in a much better space to bring your round table, your experts and say, okay, this is what I wanna own. This is important to us. So before we do this contract, as I'm negotiating this contract, this is what I want to happen. This is what I want to own during the contract period. And here is what I'm allowing the other side to continue using or not use after the contract. Now you're prepared. You're the expert who has pulled that together. And when you have the contract in place, there's fewer questions or fears or mystery as things are going, as things are getting developed. You know where the IP goes. You know who owns it. You know what you own. You're leveraging it. And during the contract negotiation, you can actually gain a lot of ground and use these things as bargaining chips because you've already triaged your intellectual property. You know what you have. You might have a good idea of what they want and what they need, certainly after you build this thing, whatever it is. And you will have an understanding of what you can own and how you can leverage it. So let's talk about a little, talk a little bit about your company's IP. Patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. So excuse me, patents are, the purpose of a patent is to protect novel technology, function, and structure. Copyrights protect expression and include software. I know there's some dichotomy there. Doesn't matter about the function. Copyrights protect your software. Think about source code. Think about things that, you know, the, the ultimate expression comes out when the software engineers are creating things and you can protect that actual code, right? And that protects you from when your code gets stolen, for example. And they, they, they blanketly use your code as you wrote it. That's a copyright infringement. And that's the protection that you get for software, for example. For patents, it's much broader. 
It doesn't matter how you write the code. It doesn't matter how you build your widget, your design, your systems, your device. Patents focus on the function. So however they build it, patents are much more powerful and you get much more coverage. Um, design patents are you know, aesthetic, design, look and feel type of thing, <clears throat> similar to copyrights, but it gives somewhat different protection. They're also much less expensive than patents. Um, and they have different lifestyle, life cycles. You know, patents have 20 years from filing. Um, design patents have 15 years from grants. Copyrights left life plus 70 years and varies too, depending on your corporation and when you developed it and, and things like that. I included a link here um, that lays out more of life, uh, life scales of, of uh, copyrights and things. Um, trade secrets can be protected and can be kept indefinitely um, for the life of the company. Um, as can trademarks because they're based on they're based on use. And as long as you protect all of these properly, you understand what they are, you can understand the life cycle of these things. Um, keep in mind, and this is the last note on this slide, is that every IP asset begins life as a trade secret. I think I said that already earlier. I just I keep echoing it because it's so, so, so important. Um, to understand your IP, to protect your IP, you have to understand it at its origin. And when you're developing or even you're selling a product to a customer, uh, whatever it is, um, every, every IP uh, asset become, begins its life as a trade secret. So you really want to lock down your trade secret program, your system, understanding what they are and hold them very tightly. Because when you're in negotiations, once you let out a secret, somebody has that secret you won't likely be able to tell if they've taken that secret and used it. That's why you're keeping it secret. You're keeping it secret because you're capable of keeping it secret. It's something that no one sees or understands. It might be the algorithm in your software. It might be something about your device that they just can't figure out by taking apart and trying to reverse engineer it. All these things, um, especially uh, software algorithms that are in your source code. No one will likely ever see that unless they're able to tease it out by playing with the function of your product. I had a client that had a ophthalmic device. These are the devices where you go see your optometrist and they're testing your eye, they're measuring your eye, they're doing different things to test for disease and, and, and measuring uh, different optics. And he had a device, they filed 150 patents on or more, and, but he had some trade secrets. And what's interesting, and he's disclosed this already, is that there was part of this that was a trade secret that made it impossible to even copy this thing. And there were some companies that took the, you know, they ordered the product, they brought it overseas, they took it apart and they tried to copy it and they put the thing back together and it wouldn't work. Even the original device wouldn't work because they couldn't figure out how to calibrate it. So forget about copying it. They couldn't even put the thing back together that was built for them. They sent it back to him and he saw that they took it apart. He saw that they didn't properly put it back together because they didn't have the secret. The secret was the missing component was a human eyeball. And they needed humans to actually calibrate these things in the factory. And that was one of the many missing elements. So trade secrets and patents used in combination, these things can make your, your secrets infallible. And it's very important to keep these secrets and protect them and understand what they are. So when you're in negotiations, when you're selling to customers, when you're maybe designing a device custom for them, if you've got that human eyeball element that's your secret, you don't ever want to share that. And if you do share it, then we'll talk about trade secrets a little bit more, but it's important to keep them locked down, but at least to understand when you're going in there, what to divulge and what not to divulge. And if you have you know, lead negotiators, other people involved, engineers involved, engineers love to talk about things. They love to talk about details and cool, complicated things. They need to be very well educated about what trade secrets are, what they should be disclosing and what they should be keeping secret and why. Okay, every IP asset begins life as a trade secret. So what do you audit? <clears throat> now, life in, in intellectual property, especially around trade secrets, um, doesn't begin and end with the intellectual property that you register. Um, trade secrets should not be a mystery to your company. In fact, you should have them at least understood and even documented. Um, and these can include 
things like you know business contacts customer lists right these are not just the things of office depot and other companies that are just supplying things this is internal information that helps your salespeople be you know johnny on the spot and jane on the spot so they can get in there and make sales these are secrets until they get out so all of this information is very important and you want to look at what really differentiates your company what gives you the edge over the competitors what do your what do your com uh, your, your customers really like um, and what does your company depend on and these can be secrets that you never divulge they can be secrets that become patents uh, copyrights and even trademarks um, and you want to uh, make sure that you kind of socialize this when you're asking the question of what is your intellectual property right talk to your inside business units uh, your wiki special expert partners customers um, publicly owned technology you may think wow that's not a secret well it can be because you can have a lot of stuff that's out there in the public information generally and it may be scattered and internally you might have information that kind of pulls it all together and tells a different story a very secret story for example let's say that your company is aware of hundreds of patents that cover a certain thing and your way of designing around them your way of avoiding infringement or if you have information on a certain technology that everybody's kind of missing out there that you can even get these components that are openly for sale but the way you put them together and the way you set up your manufacturer makes you know is a differentiator for you so all of that stuff is trade secret during the contract when intellectual property is created you're developing technology you're bringing in experts Maybe even you're just bringing in um, some consultants or representatives from your customers who are going to use the ultimate product, sharing you with you their requirements, some of their internal trade secrets that are required to build your product. And you have to know what you're building for them, right? All of that is trade secret information. And keep in mind when you're working on contracts and you're and you're engaging with them that there's a good chance you may be also taking in others intellectual property and trade secrets that you need to care for and you'll see these in contracts you will care for our trade secrets just like you care for your trade secrets right language like that right and some companies like chip producers for example tsmc tsmc is a huge company in taiwan they make all the chips for most of the companies in the world and they take in intellectual property trade secrets from their customers. They use those trade secrets to make their chips and they deliver the chips. Absolutely vital information. And they have lockdown systems for treating, keeping separate, and not sharing this intellectual property with other customers who may want to see it among their competitors. So you want to, in your audit, you want to understand how your company uses intellectual property, trade secrets yours others right other people who own trade secrets you need to understand it really well because you can get burdened with having to deal with trade secret protection understanding what trade secrets are not just the fear of losing your own trade secrets but possibly inadvertently mishandling other companies trade secrets and that's liability that you don't need and often that you might not even expect so understanding trade secrets, you, sure, they become other intellectual property. You want to understand how, how you handle them, how others will handle yours, and how you will handle others' trade secrets as well. It sounds really complicated, but it's really all about care, lockdown, confidentiality, and understanding who owns what <clears throat> so that you can know how to care for it, right? And once you have all this information, you can start thinking about, okay, what are we going to patent? What are we going to copyright? What are we going to keep secret, right? In this marketing campaign, are, when are we going to, before we release all of our marketing information and we release our product, what are we going to share with other people? You know, you can imagine that Apple does not share its designs, its trademark names, or anything else about their products before they release them. However, they need to share that information with their business partners, companies that are putting together their phones and their laptops and their iPads, right? 
This is trade secret information that you might receive from a company like Apple, or you might be Apple who shares this information with your vendors. And <clears throat> you want to keep a very close lock and at least an understanding on how your trade secret information is shared. And, you know, it starts internally. You have to educate your employees as well. All of your employees, even the person working at the greeting desk at your front door, everybody has to understand what your trade secrets are and how they're locked down. Locked doors, passwords, all these things. But there's so many opportunities for sharing trade secrets inadvertently. You really got to understand where those holes are. You know, going back to my to my 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 image back in, in slide number two, you see this stuff leaking out, and you don't want it to be a leak that you don't intend. You can let the stuff leak out. In fact, it might even be part of your marketing campaign, right? It's a mysterious leak. But you want to understand and have control over your trade secrets and whether you deliberately leak them or if you lock them down and keep them, right? So <clears throat> audit what you own. Dig deep. Let's talk about confidentiality. This is kind of the core of things where, I mean, you see these in contracts all the time. And in fact, I think uh, In-House Connect recently did a, uh, a talk on NDAs, right? And, uh, and, and I've, I hear all the time, they'll say, do you have an NDA I can use? You know, some startup company or some individual, I know they're worthless, nobody can ever enforce an NDA, but I feel like I got to put it out there, you know, so that, people, so that I look serious. And, and that kind of attitude frightens me, right? So, so when it comes to NDAs and anything that has confidentiality, you know, confidentiality is a part of just about every contract, certainly uh, around trade secrets and intellectual property. You want to really understand it well, because when you start sharing trade secrets or however you're protecting trade secrets internally, externally with partners or anyone else, you want to understand how your confidentiality uh, language is crafted and used and what the risks are, right? Um, you want to limit the exposure to those who actually need to know for sure, right? Who, what is being disclosed and who's going to see it? So when you're looking at these outside entities, there are people there. There are people that are looking <coughs> at your stuff, these human beings, and you want to control their behavior. Now, you don't have a leash on them necessarily, and, and you can't control what they say and do, <coughs> but you put the contract terms out there so it's very clear when you're engaging in business with other outsiders, that everybody understands and agrees how things are being handled. Who are you going to let them disclose to? Only internally, experts that they hire, their vendors, look out. So now you've got third-party entities that are third-party even to the company you're working with, and you may not know them, but you want to know them. You want to make sure you're clear who gets it, right? And you want to limit the exposure to who actually needs to know. And you should have a good understanding of that, especially if you're doing some type of joint development agreement where you, you, have, you know their team, they know your team, you know what kind of operations and business behavior is expected. So when you understand that, you want to know who's actually seeing it or to have a good understanding of what groups are going to see it internally. So you know the people who are attached that are actually seeing your stuff. And you also just don't want to freely let them share it around the company. Put it on the internal wiki. Hey, here's a bunch of trade secrets. We're building a customer product, right? Uh-uh, no way. You want to have control and understand who actually sees this stuff, right? And if you can, require a list of people who actually need to know and who are actually going to see it and, and why and, and validate it. Um, and once you have that, it's, you know, it's not just you, this in-house counsel, general counsel, lead negotiator, who is really making these decisions, right? I mean, you want to you want to be able to advise people, but there are people out there that are in the front lines that are doing this. And there are managers, CEOs, who have objectives and who have reasons for engaging in this outside business and, and exposing potentially the intellectual property. And they, they should know, you know, what's being disclosed to who and why, because if you think about it, if they understand what your differentiators are, your trade secrets and your other intellectual property, their decisions might change based on what this other outside entity is requesting or demanding 
to see of your intellectual property. So you need buy in there because you don't want to be held for those mistakes where, oh, we're just using the standard language. This is what everybody does. No, you want to make sure that everybody understands what the objective is in this business contract uh, arrangement, the negotiations that lead to interaction with outside uh, entities. And who's going to see the trade secrets? Who's going to own the, intellectual, the resulting intellectual property? And, uh, and what are they going to do with it? Right. Um, and you want to be really careful when you limit um, the different obligations. Right. So trade secrets are a really tricky one. Right. Um, and with regard to NDAs or any other agreement where you have confidentiality, <clears throat> as we talked about earlier, trade secrets can last forever as long as you keep it secret. But what happens when you, you know, put a limit on your NDA saying you need to protect our trade secrets indefinitely well careful with that word the judge looks at that and says boy looks like this contract is indefinite now you got problems right so indefinite contracts can be at risk and invalid contracts can kill trade secrets scary thought i want you to stop and, and, and think about that for a second you have a contract that talks about trade secrets that could possibly be indefinite you engage in a business agreement, some type of discussion arrangement. You don't even build a product for somebody, right? You share trade secret information. There's this, you know, complete openness to information so that everybody understands, agrees, and can build this new thing. And then you have a fallout. You have some type of dispute where you're complaining about how this company has misused your trade secrets, for example, right? You pull out this contract, it's indefinite. You've already shared all your trade secrets. And this contract has been, let's say it's been held indefinite. A judge thinks it's indefinite. What happens to the trade secrets that you share? It might not be obvious what it is. And it, the judge is not necessarily going to care. They're certainly going to want to do the right thing. But imagine if you share these trade secrets and the company or outside person or entity has these trade secrets and they're no longer obligated to protect them for you. They may even be able to use them with impunity. I know it sounds extreme, but it's possible. So you want to be very careful with your NDAs and any confidentiality agreement that you want to lay out the general context and the subject matter so, you, so the world knows what they're, you're talking about when you're talking about a con well, judge, for example, talking about a contract. And you want to be very clear um, what exactly you're sharing and what the obligations are. <clears throat> for example, for the term of a contract of, of trade secrets, you expect them to last forever, your algorithms and things, right? You might just put a very long tail on this, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. That might not even seem long enough to some people in your company, but it's not indefinite. So you can get creative here get some very long-term protection without being concerned about indefiniteness. And I have seen, I'm not kidding in my career, hundreds of NDAs that are that, that use these indefinite tails. You need to protect our stuff forever and we will protect your stuff forever. That doesn't make it better, right? It doesn't make it better. Hey, Dave, uh, yeah. there, there's, sorry to interrupt. There are some questions that are uh, pushing back on this on this vice. Okay. Um, so the question is, why would the obligation to keep trade secret secret for as long as in another party's possession be invalid? The alternative the alternative is time binding, time binding the obligation, which is incompatible with the secrecy since it's fair game after a period of time. And a shout out to Jeff Gross, who is asking the, these hard hitting questions. So thank you, and, and keep the questions coming in the chat. So, what what do you think to, about that, Dave? It's a great question. It's a great question. I was going to get into that next, and, and I'm glad you brought it up too. Um, it's there's conflict. There's conflict, and the problem is you get in front of a judge. Imagine getting in front of a state judge where intellectual property isn't their specialty. You know, they're just looking at this this contract and looks indefinite to them, right? What's the remedy? What if nothing is said about hey, if this is found indefinite, what do we do with the trade secrets? Put that in the contract. Right. So it's there is a conflict, but it's a very real thing. And there are cases where there the, the protection of trade secrets were not protected because the contract was indefinite. 
the result, and I always want to go back to, it's not always solved in the language of the contract. Often the better way to resolve these issues is in the business behavior and in the interaction. So when you have burdens of taking on trade secrets or there are trade secrets that are being requested of you or your company, you want to discourage that as much as possible. And you want to share as few trade secrets as you absolutely need to. And often they're, they're brought out with, you know, these, these, uh, you know these, these obligations of, look, we need to understand how this is done, what it's done, so that we can complete our business together. Well, you're better off trying to work around that behavior so that you can actually deliver the product without disclosing your trade secret. Also, <clears throat> when it comes to disclosing trade secrets to another company, sometimes it makes sense and this is really a business decision to share your trade secret so that they also now have ownership of a trade secret. You can license them the trade secret and you still have the trade secret, right? So as long as you both keep it secret and you have this understanding on how it's being used by them and you, then you can get around loss or leakage of trade secrets. So therefore, they're gonna they're gonna hold this trade secret as valuable to their company as you do to yours. Yeah. So if I'm understanding, I'll I'll sort of paraphrase. So if a trade secret has to be secret, and we put a 30 year time limit on it, what at the end of the 30 years, it's not a trade secret anymore, right? Well, you could put you could put other obligations in there where they're you know as far as they're not allowed to openly disclose the trade secret. They're not allowed okay. to publish trade secrets, right? It doesn't mean that they have freedom to just share your trade secrets with the world, right? And it's just something you really wanna keep a tight lockdown on. And the point of, of, of that discussion was that if you leave it indefinite, it's at risk if it ever gets in front of a judge, right? There is no 100% uh, solution to this but there are ways of working around it. So first of all, you know, don't disclose your trade secrets if you don't have to. Know who's is getting disclosed to, possibly share your trade secrets. Um, that is the obligations of protecting them together um, and, uh, and, and have long tails on the, on the protection. All right, residual clauses, which is related, right? And residual clauses, are often not known or understood by many companies. It's essentially what built Microsoft, right? And it goes way, way back where residual clauses enable parties to an interact to, to a, you know, a conversation sharing trade secrets or even patents and other intellectual property to get a free license to them just from their discussion, right? So a residual clause is the following. Imagine two companies getting together they're doing a joint development agreement and they're sharing trade secrets and they're sharing other technical information. And this trade secrets might in the future become patents, they might become copyrights, and they may remain trade secrets with, with the company. So the way a, a residual clause goes that if our technical people go in there and they hear your technical information, trade secrets at the time or any kind of information or technology, if they leave this conversation and through other uh, operations inside the company, they inadvertently employ, use your technology and incorporate it into their product inadvertently without the intent of stealing technology, they get a free license. They get a free license. And so when, when a residual clause is at play, and there is a recipient of most of the trade secret information, often what they'll do is send in their, their technocrat that has an excellent computer level memory, uh, you know, visual memory, and, and they can leave with all of that technology and all of those thoughts and ideas, and they can likely incorporate those things into products. The problem with residual clauses, aside from what I just said, which seems just, just monstrous, and they are, is that it's very difficult to prove that some person was not inadvertent, that they went in there and intentionally said, you know, I'm just gonna learn everything. 
We're going to walk away and not do business with this company. And I'm just going to incorporate the technology. Unless you've got some type of email that actually lays out that sinister plan, or you have some other type of proof, extremely difficult to prove. So often what we do with these, when they appear, cross them out. You don't need them. In fact, you can just do it on moral grounds because they're just, they're very difficult to deal with, right? And, uh, and so if you disclose trade secrets in this discussion, and maybe you just filed the patents or you're going to file the patents, even if you did your pre-contract triage and protected everything, if they walk away and incorporate these things, they get a license through their residual clause and you don't, they have, they have no accounting back to you, right? So when you see these, you wanna strike them out, right? Um, they essentially become the IP of the recipient, even if they are protected with patents and trademarks or anything or copyrights or anything else. Now you can counter this with many in many different ways. You can restrict these things. You can also, of course, not disclose your trade secrets, um, but it's it's not foolproof, right? Um, but looking at the business behavior too, I've actually worked in transactions where they ultimately accepted this residual clause. You would think that that's crazy, right? But in the business behavior, what they concluded, they didn't have the bargaining power to cross it out. They didn't. They wanted to get this customer. They wanted to do this deal because this company, it was a small startup company and they needed it. But in the behavior in the company, in the operation, they never disclosed trade secrets and they never had to disclose really what their algorithms were or any of their underlying intellectual property. So they agreed to this residual clause because in the end, when they really thought it through, throughout the business arrangement that was proposed, they really weren't going to disclose anything. And just because they have a residual clause and they, they may infringe your patents or do different things, they would need to prove that they actually learned it or they you know, somehow saw it and inadvertently incorporated it. But if you're never gonna be sharing these things, then a residual clause will not have really, it, it won't have the, the risk that, that they normally would if there was an open sharing of, of trade secrets. So you wanna look at um, what happens to your trade secrets and what you're likely gonna disclose, what trade secrets are gonna actually empower this other side to you know, make it without you, and to decide to make it themselves rather than to hire you or to, to buy your products. Any questions before we get into warranties and representations? Let's keep going. Yeah. The, the so, Q and A, the Q and A section is going to be nice and and very lively. So. Uh, well, that's great. That's great. Bring it on. I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So warranties and representations. You know, a lot of these are boilerplate. People don't think much about warranties and representations, right? But often, what you'll see in relation to intellectual property are things where statements are made, positions are taken, right? Where um, you might make this representation that you know, you're delivering a product and that you own the technology. Well, sometimes that could be interpreted as, well, you said you own the technology. We just got sued for patent infringement. We just got sued for patent infringement. You said you own, now somebody owns your intellectual property, right? So you might even have, you know, threats of infringement on your own where, where they, you, you've got, you, you know, some companies are always getting hit with patents and especially bigger companies, patent trolls and, and other entities that are you know, going after their products and they may or may not be meritorious. They might just be, you know, you know, just shakedown litigation, right? And these can be, unless you, you, you know, you're careful in wording your warranties and representations, your statements uh, can be carefully crafted so they're not held against you, right? And look at the promises that are made. So for example, you might even, I've seen this before where it says, you know, we warrant that we do not infringe any third party patents, any patents that we don't already have a license to, right? You can never make that statement. You can never make that statement because patents are constantly being filed. They're being um, prosecuted in the patent offices, both in the United States and around the world. You don't know what claims are coming out of that process and you can't even see them. When you file a patent, it's kept secret for 18 months in the United States. And it can be even longer if you request that it not get published, right? So no one can even see it. 
this cannot be ascertained. The risk cannot be ascertained. You cannot make that statement that you don't infringe patents um, and you, you can't say it without any qualification, right? Trademarks, you could say that, yeah, we own our trademarks. They are registered and we have a right to use them. So there you go. There's a registered certification that you can use the trademarks. Copyrights, similar, right? Patents, you can't do it, right? So the best way to limit these things is based on knowledge. And these are usually very logical and accepted where they say, you know, we, to our knowledge, we do not have any threats of intellectual property, incredible ones for this product that we're delivering to you, right? So rather than making these blanket, blanket statements that sound, you know, oh boy, we're standing by our product. And often your customers will say that. We want you to stand by your product. You own this product. Promise us that you don't infringe any patents out there. Can't do it because they can't be ascertained. And that's the best logical uh, response that you can have when they're really pushing this language on you. And you have to understand this level of patents and copyrights and other intellectual property to be able to push back. And your ability to push back is your ability to have the knowledge and the understanding to give them reasons why what they're asking for is not reasonable. We can't agree to this because we cannot ascertain whether or not we're filing, you know, millions of patents that exist in the world. Everybody essentially infringes some patent somewhere, right? And, but not every patent is being enforced. Not every patent owner cares. And some of them, you just never know. They have different languages, very complex, very nuanced. So you could have a discovery later where you have, you know, some type of infringement issue that you couldn't possibly have ascertained when you signed your contract. <clears throat> Indemnities and defense. And how are we doing on time, Shai? I want to make sure that I don't run over. This is one section I want to spend a little time on. Uh, uh, we're good. Good. Okay, we're good, good. good. Yeah. Indemnities and defense. These are promises that so when you're delivering a product to a customer, you're going to stand by your product, right? And you stand by your product, not by saying that, you know, we <laughs> promising we'd never infringe any patents out there. But if you get hit with a patent lawsuit or copyright, some other, some other, you know, trade secret theft or something, right? Where we're delivering your product, we're going to defend you. We're going to take over the case and defend you against this, this accuser, right? Um, especially if a threat materializes into some type of lawsuit. And we're gonna indemnify you for any damages that occur. So they're gonna pay for the legal defense, you are gonna pay as, as a product person, a company delivering a product or a service, you're going to defend them and you're going to indemnify them if there's, if there's any, uh, any kind of judgment against you, right? So what are your risks here? Well, it's very important to understand that you wanna put limits on this. Um, because if you have an open indemnity or defense, you could end up fighting every battle that this customer or other entity, vendor or someone else, any battle that comes after them, and you'll need to pay for the defense and the indemnity. You want to put limits on it. Number one is you want to, you want to get control. So if there is a threat and it really is against the product that you delivered, you're going to want control over this thing. Because if they're going after one customer, they're going to go after all your customers. In fact, that's how many patent, patent trolls, patent entities, uh, enforcement entities, that's how they go after companies. They don't want to go after the product producers necessarily. They go after the customers. Customers settle faster. There's more exposure to these customers. Uh, and it's usually easier for the enforcement entities to deal with them, right? They can get more out of them as a group, then they may get out of you as a product producer. You're selling wholesale, they're selling retail, right? So you wanna have control over this thing and you wanna take over the defense because you want control. Although it's, it is expensive, in the long run, you're better off because you're in a better position to get global settlements with multiple defendants rather than you know, allowing some company to fight their own battle and come to you with the invoice, right? Um, so you want control. And you also want to have limits as to what you're willing to defend and indemnify. Um, if the patent infringement suit, for example, if the claims 
read on the end product of the customer, then that's one thing. But if those claims do not read on the product that you supplied, you shouldn't need, you shouldn't be required to defend or indemnify them. Uh, and, and you could work on the different language. There's an example in a paper that I wrote, I think I shared it with everyone, where you can limit the level that you need, the, the types of products or, or the types of technology that you need um, to, to defend and indemnify. So it's limited to what you actually provide. And that does a couple of things. One, it limits the cost of the indemnity to the product component that you made. Imagine if you're, you're providing a chip to an automobile and they sue the automobile because they have these big system claims, right? Well, it's not fair that you, you, get, you, get, you have to pay, you know, defend and indemnify your customer against these system claims that involve other companies' products because your product could be non-infringing. So you want to limit those and you want to limit to what you're going to defend and what you're going to indemnify. As a smaller company, you don't necessarily want to defend a company if they're sued for billions of dollars, if this product that you delivered only costs millions of dollars, right? Or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you can put limits on the total indemnity that you're willing to pay um, and also the limits to the types of defense that you will take on. So these types of limits are very important because Indemnities improperly written and you know defense promises, um, they could run you bankrupt. They could run a company bankrupt. And with these reasonable types of limits, you can manage the indemnities and the defenses. Um, and un unless you're really careful about these limitations, um, they could really run beyond what you expected to pay and what type of uh, responsibilities you're willing um, to take on. Um, so you want to lay out very carefully in my paper I do that talks about the, you know, the types of cases that you're willing to indemnify and the obligations for the customer to turn this over to you, give you all the information that you need to defend the case, and also limits on the specific remedies and what you're willing uh, to pay in case there's a, in case there's a loss. So in, there's lots of other sections we could talk about. We talk about the in the further in the uh, in the discussion afterward, uh, but it's important to understand again the basics. Understand what intellectual property you have and what are these what are these things? What are these assets? Do you have a program that protects everything? Put this program in place pre-contract so you're not scrambling later, right? Trade secrets, for example, for trade secrets you have to prove that you have possession of the trade secret before somebody allegedly steals it. So you want time-stamped evidence of that trade secret, even if it becomes later a patent or a, or a copyright or some, or, or a product that gets disclosed, right? You wanna be able to put a timestamp on the, when you had possession of this trade secret before it goes into play, before it gets exposed. That way you can prove if something's been stolen or somehow misappropriated. So pre-contract, you want to be all over it. You want to understand your intellectual property, what you have, what's going to be created. And you want to be able to negotiate the optimum terms of the country, of the company that, that protect your IP. So that's all I have. I want to thank again, everybody for coming here. In-house connect. Shai, you did a great job as usual. Thanks so much thank for you. including me and, and, uh, and giving me your time. And I'm happy to stick around as long as anybody likes to, uh, to answer any questions. Awesome. awesome. So thank you, Dave. Lots of great questions came in. So I'm going to do my best to like, you know, group them under topics. So first, I guess a basic one, can you discuss the difference between confidential information and trade secrets? Sure. So uh, they're, they're interrelated, right? So trade secrets themselves are in order to be a trade secret, this thing, this secret needs to have value by its secrecy. So it's something that's not on the public. It's something that is um, valuable to your company. And we're, we're talking, you know, business list. We're talking about technology and specific things, right? Conf and that's an entity. And a trade secret is an intellectual property. And if you keep it secret, you take the steps to protect your trade secret. Um, and, and, you, you know, you have a, a system and program so that so it's not easily, so it's not accessible by anybody outside the company you have an intellectual property asset. Confidential information is basic information that is kept confidential 
based on the contract. So trade secret is protected based on your behavior, your secrets and how you protect them. Confidential information is what you're imposing on this other party to keep secret, right? And it may even be things that are, you know, not necessarily viable as a trade secret, right? It might not be a trade secret. It might even be a discussion of, hey, we're planning this business line and we're just gathering information. If that's in the hands of some other company, they might say, hey, I'm going to go do the same thing. There's not enough information there necessarily to, you know, to, 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 to protect any kind of technology. But the fact that, say, you know, that Intel is going to go into a very specific um, type of chip technology, they're going, to, they're going to start investing in a certain technology in a specific IoT, that could be valuable to AMD, for example. Just this, this direction or movement can be kept confidential, right? Once people see and learn that they're doing it, it's not going to be a trade secret, but you might want to keep it confidential no matter what you're talking about. Even the fact that you're having this discussion with them, even that the fact that you signed a contract, you want to keep that confidential, even if it may not qualify as a trade secret. Got it. Got it. So thank you for that. The next question or a topic rather is how do you protect IP and trade secrets and patents when you are working with third party? And also like, let's say you're a smaller company and it's a, you're working with a bigger company. Like what are some best practices and tips for, for managing that, that data transfer? Right. I think what you're talking about is really bargaining power, right? Small company, big company. And <clears throat> when it comes to these types of disputes, well, it's never fair or even because the big company has lots more power, lots more money for fighting. But if you, if you properly protect your intellectual property and you're fair on your contracts, then you're on the same playing field when it comes to things like contract, uh, you know, breaches of contract or infringement of intellectual property. And the best thing you can do when you don't have the bargaining power is to fight back with reason. And, and often, you know, when, when you hire lawyers and you're dealing with a larger company, big companies don't necessarily want to have that reputation of beating up small companies, of, of, of imposing difficult language on them. And I, I hate to mention any companies, I won't mention any specific companies, but there are some big companies that really are truly abusive, historically abusive. And you want to do your best to try to like, at least reason with them and try to get rid of things like residual clauses or take the teeth out of them with reason. And in those negotiations, you can usually get them removed. And if you can't get them removed, if the language is really oppressive, you need to step back and, and ask, do you really want to do business with them? Because there's probably a good reason why they're twisting your arm. They might not want to deal with you. I mean, nothing against you personally, but they might have a whole group of people that, ha that has nothing else to do. Let's hand it over to this group over here, this idea and say, hey guys, take a shot at that. In fact, I had a client just the other day where it was exactly that. They were developing a new type of energy storage, right? Batteries and things like that. Five years ago, he went together with this company. They were negotiating. They said, you know, we're just not, we're going to kill this program. They spent the last five years trying to do it themselves. Five years. And this was an individual, a tech, an inventor. They came back to him and they said, you know what? And they were very honest about it. They said, we try to do it ourselves and we can't do it. We try to do it ourselves and we failed. It often happens. Let them go, let the tail wag, right? I mean, sometimes you need to walk away and know what you're walking away from. Understand your intellectual property, what is truly important to you, your trade secrets and all your different intellectual property. Don't just give them away in hopes that you're going to have this business relationship, right? Think about it. This is a business decision. This is where you need to talk to all the stakeholders. Say, guys, ladies, look at this. They want our trade secrets. They can go and build this themselves if we give this to them. So I think we need to walk away. And here's a good example. There's a good case. Uh, I for I. That's letter I, number four, letter I, V Microsoft. Now, I'm not mentioning any particular companies, right? But that is a real case, right? Where Microsoft went in, they were looking for uh, uh, an HTML editor, right? And they went to look for the best of class. And this is the story you get from the case, right? Where they went in, they looked under the hood, 
And I for I is like, awesome, Microsoft, we get into their products, we're going to be everywhere, right? They went in and had a nice long technical discussion, spent a lot of time together. Then everything went quiet. Everything went quiet. And in 2008, Microsoft came out with an HTML editor and I for I said, hey, that's ours. So they sued them for patent infringement. They didn't sue them for trade secret misappropriation because it's difficult to prove. And they ended up winning the case. They ended up winning the case. And <clears throat> they, they fought it right to the Supreme Court, right? And, and in the end, it was, a, it was a, a patent infringement case that won, that won the day, right? So often when you're up against these big companies, they're going to fight tooth and nail and just take your technology, right? I'm not making any statements against Microsoft. I apologize to any Microsoft people out here, but, but there was a case where, you know, the, the, what was alleged is that this, this technology was taken and that they were not willing to pay for it. And, and they fought to take it. Big companies will take your technology. They will take it. So no one to walk away. There definitely could be Microsoft people on the, the call. So good, good disclaimer. So the next so thank you for that. The next topic I want to talk about, and it personally piqued my my interest, is work work made for higher language and, and custom deliverable. So a couple of things. I'll say like all the different questions and you can, you know, respond sure. as appropriate, but a couple of things. So one commenter said, I've heard that work made for higher language does not mean what people think it means. That you know, are there magic words for, you know, getting the IP assigned or having it being assigned from a employee or a contractor? Or are there like some like absolute no-nos in terms of contract drafting mistakes? So it's like, if there's work, work made for higher language in a contract with a, you know, consultant for, let's say, custom code or, or whatever it is, is that basically the company owns that IP? Is that fair statement? Okay, so work made, for, yeah, fair statement. Um, work made for hire is related to copyrights. And if you're talking about software code or, or creating some artistic work and things like that, um, often uh, companies rely on work for hire. And that's actually in the contract. This is a work for hire. We're paying you to do the following, right? As the person who's providing the service, who's providing, creating the work, who's doing the work, let's talk from both sides, right? So if you're, let's say you're a consultant, you're a software company, you've got a bunch of stuff that you've pulled together over the years. Yeah, you're creating something for them. It's specific for their application. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that you're pulling off your shelf that you own that you're going to put into their product. Those things don't necessarily need to belong to your customer once you deliver it, exclusively that is, right? Because work for hire, things the company owns that they hired, that's stuff they own. That's some stuff that you no longer own, right? So you wanna separate that out, especially in the contract. So here's a good example. There's, there's a, one client I had, they had this, it, it was a type of security in their software. So it was, it was a software they made for inventory and different things like that. Um, but there was this encryption technology that they use that they put in all their software. Here's this thing they developed many years ago, and they're always updating it, right? And they take this, okay, let's plug this in because everything needs to be encrypted in this financial transaction part of the program. And it's a small part of the program, but it's something they stick in there, right? And they own that. When you sell that product, that company that you sold it to doesn't own that. In fact, their use is limited to when they're using your product. So in this, this one case I worked on, this is a copyright case, right? It was a work for hire and they delivered it, but they have these, they call them rotors, different, different components, right? That they plug in there. This was one of them. Just by chance, the founder of this company had a conversation with a former employee of this gigantic company who bought his product and he mentioned the name of his company. And he said, oh yeah, we standardized on that encryption technology. What does that mean? What do you mean you standardized on that? I just sold you a product, right? And he didn't, he was just listening. And it turns out they took that encryption code and they incorporated it into all of their own products, products that they did not buy from this company, this, this, this group that did work for hire. That's not their product. That's not theirs. They don't own that. 
they sued that company for copyright infringement. And there were the copies, it was something like $100,000 per company penalty. Millions of products were delivered. And the numbers are astronomical. It settled out like all cases, most cases do, right? But there's a good example of a company that protected themselves. They're very clear in their contracts that these components are not yours, but this thing we put together for you is yours. In fact, they were, they were um, selling the product um, to other companies as a, as a clearinghouse, but they were selling their completed product. When they started taking it apart and using different components, that's where they had problems. So work for hire is very real, but you got to make sure in your contracts that you protect yourself. Now, as a company, you're buying this product. You want freedom to use the product, or if you are reselling it, freedom to resell and even repair. I'm just talking about software, right? Other things. So you want to make sure that you look at your prospective business arrangement, what you expect to do in your roadmap with this thing, and be very clear that we own this so that we can do this, right? We don't want to take your stuff apart and inappropriately use intellectual property that's not related to what we bought. We want to be able to use this product. Now, if they're going to take these components and use them on other stuff, it's different pricing, right? You, you probably won't mind if they use your components as long as they pay for it. So you want to really look very carefully and think through how this product is expected to be used, how it could be inappropriately used, and just build it into the, to the contract and understand it and use it, right? I have another question. Let's say we're in a work made for hire situation and you know the clause basically says upon full payment of, of the fees, the, the you know, this shall be a work made for hire. Like, you know, payment of full full payment of fees is a uh, you know, it's a condition precedent essentially right. for for tra for transferring the, the IP. So let's say buyer doesn't you know, fulfill that and doesn't pay. Maybe there's a payment dispute or, or what? Maybe they just run out of money. Who owns the IP then? Yeah, well, that's settled in the dispute, right? So it's a very good question. And you want to have that language in there too, is that, again, it's not even just broadly that, you know, that, that is the work for hire, it, you know, that, that this event occurs upon payment. If there is non-payment, you want to put in specifically what you want to happen. And it's all fair. Right. So if there's non-payment, then the, 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 the customer, however you say it, is not allowed to use this product. They don't own it. They don't use it. Even the part that we created custom for them. Right. So you want to be very clear in the contract what that is. You want to be friendly, too. You want to be able to have an open business relationship so it doesn't disrupt that. Um, but you don't want to necessarily rely on, you know, if you don't pay, that's not a work for hire. Right. Because it, it's, it is a work for hire because you're, you're working. You're building it, you're making it, you're being hired. You might end up with just a contract dispute where they owe you money, right? And you go and fight that. And that could be smaller than what they do with this product and take and use it. They're not going to be able to openly use it if they don't pay you. And what if they use it in ways that you didn't contemplate, right? So you want to be very clear on what, uh, what occurs upon payment. Got it. So next series of questions are around indemnification. And I, first, this first question really speaks to me because it happens a lot. Um, when getting an IP indemnity against patent infringement from a software licensor, is it critical to push back against the typical exclusion for infringement arising out of combining the product with third party product? You know, since most software related patents tie to computer hardware that would likely be owned by the user, it seems like this exclusion could, you know, swallow the entire indemnification provision. Is the questioner, you know, being too technical or is this a legitimate concern? It's totally legitimate concern. It's, it's very easy to back out. Well, it can be easy to back out of indemnity obligations if they say, hey, you know, we just supplied a, con a, a component. And this is not about the component, they're after your product, right? What you wanna do is to, as much as you can, that you have bargaining power, is to, um, to try to get in the restrictions where if you, so, so you're the one who, who, who wants to receive the indemnity, right? So let's look at both sides. So if you're the one who's looking to be indemnified, you're buying this component, you're incorporating into your product, you're selling your vehicle or whatever it is with this component, right? Is that, um, if this dispute arises over our use of your product 
And as long as this use is foreseeable, then we want to be indemnified. So let's say, for example, you got a computer chip, a general use computer chip. It's used in a good a vehicle is a good example, right? Maybe you're using the computer chip for uh, dashboard information. Maybe it's like a GPU or something, right? Or you have another chip that's looking that that's controlling um, engine operations, and another one that's combining, you know, the convenience group, you know, lights and seats and all these different things, right? And then the company gets sued on the dashboard use, right? It's the same processor that you have anywhere else, but it's used there, right? And you look at the patent claims and it really is a patent claim about, you know, this system. So if the claims cover the system, your chip is just a part of it, it's not fair to, to go after you for patent infringement if you're just supplying a basic piece of hardware. If you have software included that is controlling the whole thing, then looking at the claims, you want to look at the patent claims. And this is part of the, the analysis, right? You look at the patent claims and see, are those patent claims covering the thing that you covered? General processor, not likely. Most of those patents are expired nowadays, right? Uh, unless it's something very specific, like a quad core, or whatever it is, right? But your processor plus software you're delivering, it gets a little bit closer. It's a little more open field. And if the claims cover that, could be fair. But if it goes beyond that and requires the hardware, and if the hardware is unique, you want to know where the boundaries are, right? So in doing so, you want to lay out the boundaries as much as you can in your contract, where, I mean, you could be very specific and say, if the claims are covered directly, you know, if all, if every element of a claim covers the product that we are delivering, then we will indemnify, for example. And you also may want to put in language that says, without taking on any, without making any admissions or taking on any obligations, we have the right to take a look and investigate this before we are, before we agree to indemnify. So at least it gives you a first look and understand, because much of what they're seeing is not something that's going to be at your fingertips, you know, the claim itself. Uh, you know, confidential information, maybe even like claim charts and things that they've submitted, right? As the supplier, you might not see that stuff. You want to have freedom to take a look at this thing and say, really, do we have liability? And then you get full visibility. Got it. If you're the recipient of technology, do you want a both a warranty of ownership and indemnification for third-party infringement claims, or better to tackle that in an indemnity or both? Like, what would what you recommend? Right, so the warranties and the representations are really there to give you comfort and to give you visibility, right? We warrant that, that, we, have, that, that we actually develop this technology and we talked about ownership, right? So you don't want to fight over saying, yeah, we own this technology, meaning we, we don't infringe any third-party patents, right? You can't ask them, you can't expect them to, to, to make that kind of statement because what I said before, you can't ascertain that, especially with patents, right? That's not reasonable. But you can at least get them to tell you, we don't have any claims. And that better be true, that no one has made a claim, no one has filed a patent lawsuit infringement case against us. No one has sent us a threat letter. You know, you want to vet that out. Say, hey, wait a minute. If you've already got somebody at your doorstep, I want to know about it. Because if they're at your doorstep, they're going to be at my doorstep. That's what you're asking for in the warranties, right? And, well, in the representations. that We represent that we have no threats. I have no knowledge of any threat. It might be in the mail on the way, but there's none that I'm aware of right now. And the warranty is that that we, you know, you could even put in, war you could expect warranties um, that you have patents that protect what you have, um, that you have, that you have registered copyrights for your code that you're giving us, right? That you have taken the steps to protect your intellectual property because if somebody comes after us, we want you to go after them, right? And that also kind of brings an interesting issue too, is that many software companies, many software contracts, very standard, um, that says, that um, that we that we own and develop this technology. This is this is our technology that we developed, right? If you haven't filed any patents, if you have no copyright filings, then it's difficult to say that you own this, 
right? I mean, so it, you could say it and you could own it, but having patents and copyright registrations, you don't disclose your, your, your code, by the way, when you file for copyright for your software source code. First few pages, last few pages, a statement with a cover letter. That's all it is, right? If you have those things, then you're claiming ownership. You've got a stake in ownership. And you have a timestamp when you say you owned it for trade secret as well as for copyright. So when you're making these representations that we own our technology, we're delivering you what we created, you can have proof of that. It stands by that, right? Got it. So I have a few more questions and then we'll, we'll go into uh, networking. So what, what's your thought on indemnity extending to legal costs associated with pre-suit activities? For instance, I could see a desire to not cover legal fees from a non-infringement or invalidity opinion following a patent owner's demand letter and only indemnifying the customer for actual damage. But if the customer doesn't get indemnified for those fees and just decides to ignore the demand letter, does the indemnitor risk increasing liability down the line due to willful infringement. So I guess, and like, there's another question, is there a duty to indemnify before a judgment is entered? So, you know, that general topic, I would imagine it has to be like set forth in the, in the indemnity itself um, as the ones covered, like, you know, investigation yeah. costs, all pre-suit, like there, it's like a special, you know, it has to be in there, mm -hmm. investigation costs and so on and so forth. But curious what your opinion is. Well, so in one, I'll give you an example. So in one client, they were making these, these sound cards way back when you'd buy sound cards specifically for your computer and stick it in there, right? And uh, they had, uh, they, they delivered these sound cards to a, a, a product, a, a company that made laptops, very big company, right? 14 months go by, they had a threat and they had a lawsuit against them. Opinions, legal fees in the millions, Right. And they said, hey, <laughs> they forgot about the indemnity. You know, we've been, in fact, it was funny how they approached us, the lawyers, that they said, you know, we've been very um, economical about this. We've been very careful. We've been very prudent and, and with, with charging this client. And we'd like you to pick this up and indemnify us, right? And they said, absolutely not, right? Of course, it was one of the biggest firms in the country. They charged a fortune. And it was, I'm sure it was very reasonable in their world but it wasn't in this company's world. And it went way beyond, the cost went way beyond what they paid for the sound cards themselves. So the company's like, what are you talking about, right? They ended up settling it out. Everybody wants to help each other, right? But you wanna make it very clear. This is about control. So if somebody gets a threat, you know, you talk about pre-litigation, forget it, it's threat. Don't care about what happens later, right? And you do, you're indemnifying, right? You want an indemnity, but, when you're talking about indemnities, you want to know early, is there a threat? People don't like surprises, right? You get a threat letter, you have 30 days to send it to us and surrender all the information that we need to fight this back. How did you use our chip? Who are your customers? How many did you sell? What is this threat? Do you have any relationship with this, with this company who's asserting the patent against? You know, open it up. We, we will take it over. We will pay for it. But you're our customer. We're happy to deliver it to you, but if you want this indemnity, you have some obligations. It's no different than if you, you know, hit a car in the parking lot and, and you don't tell your insurance company right away, right? A year later, I mean, come on, that's not reasonable, right? And uh, yeah, so you want that language in there and, and you want to expect that. You want to expect that, that, hey, it's a big deal giving somebody indemnity and, and defending them. It's expensive. And if you want that, you're an insurance company now. So you have some demands on your insured, as you call, it. I think that's the right term. <laughs> and you want them to, uh, to, to notify you right away. So you decide, you're the one that's under fire here. Do you want to settle this thing? Maybe it's a patent troll. You know, are you going to let these guys just overspend on getting opinions and, you know, filing an IPR and the hundreds of thousands of dollars? Hey, man, we did what you would have done. Can you pay for it? No, you want notice. And it's all about timing. You know, turn it over to us to give us all the information ASAP. All right. Last question. Um, can you talk about patent trolls and buying patents at sales and what you're seeing, how you deal with it, you know, and so on and so forth? Right, right. So, um, boy, I could do a whole talk on this, but I will keep it as brief as I can because I, I love talking about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So the best way, okay, let's talk about the companies getting hit with a patent troll, right? The best way to defeat a patent troll is to outperform them and underspend them. And that sounds contradictory when you're hiring law firms, right? But there are firms, there are specialists out there, and you might even have the internal expertise who can beat down these trolls and take the fight out of them, especially if they don't have a history of, of enforcing these particular patents. Because what they do is they start out, and there's a very common pattern where they go after the easy targets and they'll settle for cheap because that money will fund going after the big targets, right? And you wanna be that cheap target, of course, right? Um, but you don't wanna give it up very easy. And there's an awful lot of flexibility and ways to wear them down, right? And it's not hire the biggest law firm you can at $1,500 per hour and show them that you mean business. They don't care. In fact, that's the best news they could hear. You're spending hundreds of thousands per month we only want 50 grand, <laughs> right? So you want to beat them down a bit. And it's all about discretion. You know, companies, Facebook, Google, their policy, fight them to the ground, right? But they can afford that. They have lots of money. But there's a certain fight you could bring, you know, to the ring that will wear them down, right? Other defenses against patent trolls. Um, <clears throat> really, It really is all about economics. It's all about economics for them, Right. How do you prevent it? You can't prevent it. You, can, you can't prevent patent trolls coming after you, right? Um, but it's really a matter of, of managing it and managing costs. Is there troll insurance? Lindsay just added it in the chat. Is there such a thing? There is, pat, well, there is IP insurance. Right. You can get insurance against, yeah, patent trolls. You can. Um, and there, in fact, it'd probably be great to do a talk on that in general. Um, there are ways, it, it's, very, it's very valuable, right? Um, and you can, so when you apply for a policy, it's no different than applying for your life insurance policy. They want to know how healthy are you? So how healthy is your company? Have you, are you getting beat up by trolls right now? Right? So, um, if you're relatively clean and again, based on knowledge, going back to the confidentiality area, right? Is we, we have not been sued to our knowledge. We have no threats and those types of things. You apply for IP insurance. Um, it covers trademark, it covers patents, it covers other things, right? And the terms have come down considerably over the last 10 years. Um, and it depends on, of course, the size of your company and what the threat is, right? The area, how litigious are people in your area and things like that. Um, but it's usually worth it. It's usually worth it. Um, it takes a lot of risk off the table um, and it's a relatively modest um, cost. But you want to do it before the patent trolls come after you. First of all, I just want to say thank you, Dave, again, for another fantastic presentation. 